Father, we ask that you reveal the process to us, Father, as we hear your words. Lord, we thank you, love you, and praise you, Father, that you loved us enough, Father, that you created a sacrifice for our lives, Lord. Father God, just open the eyes and hearts, of our eyes and ears of our hearts, Father. Allow us to really, really, really understand and allow the Holy Spirit to interpret your words, Father, in clarity and in truth to our hearts. Father, we thank you, love you, and praise you in your precious name we pray, Father. Amen and amen. So, the first place we're going to go in the Word of God in a couple of minutes is going to be, and I'll have you put your fingers in it, Romans 12. But I'm going to, I'm going to speak a little bit. So this series on precious treasures has been amazing. And it has completely circled the word grace in such a way that if you don't understand the word grace, then, well, you need to go back and listen to all the YouTube stuff. All right? Starting from when Ethan first came up, all right, all the way up until today. Because right? really, when, when Ethan came up and spoke, I didn't know what he was speaking about, but God kind of told me that he had something that went with his series. And so Ethan spoke about how God loved him enough that he altered things around him so that Ethan would be put into a situation where God's grace could shine down on him. In that, in knowing that, the Word of God tells us that we are precious treasures. Now, for those of you that can't get here Wednesday night, or, you know, would like to be here Wednesday night, but you get home from work, go, I'm in a coma. Um, we've been speaking about releasing the treasures. And you are the catalyst for the treasures that need to be released. But how can you release the treasures if you don't understand the grace of God? You can't. How can you release the treasures... If you're not standing in positional truth, when God needs you to be in a certain situation at a certain time. Well, God, it's not a good night for me because, well, you know, I worked eight hours this week or this today, and, you know, I'm home, and, you know, I just need to relax. Now, let me ask you something. Does the Lord relax or do we pray to him? He begins a process of movement. And believe it or not, when you die, you'll have all the time to rest and relax that you ever need. Okay? Because your body's going in the ground, and if you receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior, your soul's going to heaven. You're going to get to rest. Because you'll be sitting at the feet of the Lord and you'll be able to hear him speak. And he, 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 you'll hope, you'll hope that what he says is well done and good and faithful. So, okay? So, this series has encircled the word grace, which has been the covering over us. Today, as we bring this series to the close, the last word we want to expound on today, which completes a circle of grace, is the word repent. And in the Hebrew, the word is shub. So get your pens and pencils out and your notebooks because you're going to be writing a little bit today because I'm going to tell you, when I get done, if you take everything that I've said and everything that I've given you for Greek and Hebrew words, it, it actually creates a sentence. And the sentence explains repentance. As I was sitting at my computer and I keep running from one Hebrew word to the next Hebrew word to the next Hebrew word, then all of a sudden it goes to the Greek and I'm running all the Greek words, I'm going, oh my gosh, this is absolutely amazing. And then everything I, I, I was writing and reading as I'm writing it down, all of a sudden God goes, look how it runs into Friday. And it runs into the soul. Because there needs to be a certain amount of repentance for your soul to have the pieces that are broken knit back together. And then it's by the grace of God through faith that we're restored and healed. 
So it's the word shub, S-H-O-O-B, and it means to return. It means to return to and to lay down. You see, here's what happens. As believers, and I want you to understand, I'm not talking non-Christians here. As believers, we are led astray sometimes. Some of you are going, oh, no, not me. I'm a perfect Christian. Yeah, no, you're not. No, you're not. All right? We all fall from grace once in a while. We all make decisions based on self rather than <coughs> on spirit. All right? And so, as believers, sometimes we allow the enemy to lead us astray. And sometimes we choose to walk in the way of the world rather, in the way, rather than in the way of the Lord. And something has to happen that brings us back into the righteousness of God. And that word is shub, which means, again, to return to and to lay down yourself. How do you return to what was yours originally? Well, here's what you do, all right? And this word is a verb, and it's to turn. You have to turn. You have to do this. You have to turn away from what you collectively thought was correct based upon a projection that was alive from Satan, and you have to turn back to who God is. So you can't just do this, God forgive me, and then continue to walk in the path that you've walked. You have to say, Lord, forgive me, and then you have to turn and leave what you had behind. You have to walk away. One of the things I, I tell people with addiction problems, problems is, look, you want to get you want to get right? You want to get this crap away from your life? Here's what you do. Find a different way home. Find a different store that you used to stop at. Find a different, find different everything. Do not go the way you used to go. Because the word of God says, turn. Turn away from these things. And here's another definition. When we turn, what does God do? He brings us back. And under the word shub, it means bring them back. He brings them back into the place that they were originally in his righteousness. Through forgiveness, through repentance, he brings us back to where we're supposed to be. So let me, let me, let me just reiterate this. There is a verb attached to the word repent, which means you have to take action. You can't just say, okay, God, forgive me, that's it, and continue to walk in your way. You have to say, Lord, Father God, come in. I am sorry for what I've done, and name it. And then turn in the opposite direction and walk away down the path that God had originally chosen for you in the beginning, when you became saved. So there's, there's, a, there's a verb attached to the word repent. So it takes action. You mean, Pastor Mark, I just can't say, Father, I'm sorry. And then let him do all the work? No! We have to do something. We have to turn away from it. And when we do, he brings them back. He brings them back to the grace that comes from being a precious treasure. You know, there's this shortest verse and it says he weeps in the Bible. You know, and a lot of people have different definitions for that, but I'm going to tell you what. Every time we do something against the will of God, he weeps. He weeps. And then there's another word, two words that come up. He waits. He weeps and he waits. You know why he waits? Because it's your decision what you do with your life based on what you know about him. See? I love it when people say, well, Pastor Mark, I just don't know. I don't know what to do. Yes, you do. Because if you know his word, you know what to do. <coughs> Turn from those things that distract you. Turn from those things that distract you. I'm going to tell you what. 
If you were here Friday, you can apply this message to Friday. Because one of the things we need to learn to do is turn away from the generation of curses or from the <coughs> learned behaviors and from the things that come in the name of sin. When we turn from those, there is a restoration of the broken pieces of the soul that reunite it back to the core personality of the soul, which in turn creates a whole soul. <coughs> And in that, and in that, you become healed. You become healed. So let's keep going. So, when we apply grace to repentance, we become restored. Why do we become, become restored? Because we become restored because grace was given out of love from God. So the love of God restores us to what? Wholeness. Wholeness. See, one of the big problems, and we, we, we came upon this Friday, was that we don't believe that God loves us. And we don't believe... We don't believe God loves us because something from our past has brought us to this place where we can't understand love without conditions. So we're looking for the conditions that come from love when there are no conditions. God loves us unconditionally. He loves us even in the midst of our sin, believe it or not. That's when he's weeping. That's when he's weeping. And then again, he waits. He waits. One of the things that holds us back from understanding and believing the word of God in its unconditional love is that we cannot forgive. We cannot forgive. Unforgiveness holds us back from coming to the place that God wants us to be at, which creates wholeness in him. So I'm going to tell you something. If you are holding something against somebody right now, then God can't go any further in you until you repent and turn and walk towards his grace, his mercy, and his love. You're here, and you're going further. The word of God tells me that. Unforgiveness keeps us from moving forward. But Mark, Pastor Mark, I'm repenting. But are you forgiving? See, there's two different words there. Repent means to turn from the ways that you're walking. Forgive means to let go and never hold on to. And many of us don't know how to forgive, forget, and go on. Because we're waiting for something. Have fun. Because you're going to be waiting a long time. Because I'm going to tell you what. The only thing that's going to happen is you're going to grow more angrier and more bitter. And it's going to be harder to forgive. And it's going to be harder to repent. And it's going to be harder to turn. And what's going to happen? You're going to be miserable. And then what will happen is you will walk away and you will create in you yourself. Soul trauma through in, invitation of demonic activity. Well, Pastor Mark, I'm a Christian. That's quite all right. Yes, you are. You notice I didn't say you'd allow the enemy into your heart. But you will allow him to capture a piece of a broken soul. I'm telling you, you've got to be here Friday night. Whew, I could go on, but I had to stay on this mess. But I'm excited about next Friday night. So, we are restored to our original place in Him. Now, the word repentance is a verb. There is an action that takes place. One is first, we turn from what we have become. And in that action of turning, we lay down ourselves, the atom nature of flesh, and we enter back into the right standing of God. 
That's the first part of repentance. What can wash away our sins? The grace that comes from the blood of Jesus Christ. The sacrifice. The second word in the Greek is maten e a o m e t e a n m e t a n o e h hyphen o. And it means I repent and I change my mind in the inner man. In the inner man. And in that change, in that change, I become acceptant of the will of God. So what happens? I understand the love of God. I understand the grace of God. I understand the worth of the treasure he has put upon me. And in understanding that, I make a change in the inner man, inner man, and the inner man brings about a change to the upper man, and the upper man decides to walk in God's will. <coughs> Are you understanding? Okay. So we'll make sure we're not sleeping. We're not in like a turkey coma or something. Uh, you know, that tryptophan they put in there. It's just all sweet potatoes. So, so it comes from here. The inner man, the core, understands its value. The soul understands its value. The inner man, and as the inner man creates a way for the upper man, the mind, to come to terms with the fact that, wow, I, I, I'm really loved unconditionally by God. And in that love, I understand now his will, which is what? His will is to help you understand who he is, to walk in his way, and be a servant to grace to others. So in that, I'm not walking in his will or his way, and so I make now a mental decision to turn and move away from who I was into who he has called me to be. You thought repentance was easy, didn't you? <laughs> no, there's, a, there's, a, there's so much more to this. But there has to be more because God wants us to understand how much he loves us. Because, see, it's so easy for a projection from the airwaves, from the principalities of darkness, to distract us here. So this has to be involved in order to get this to start thinking in the correct pattern so that we can, so that then, what was, the brain goes, hello, uh, yeah, move the left leg to the left. Now move the right leg. Now walk away. And we walk away. Now the base word or prefix is meta, M-E-T-A-H. And this means after. So after I recognize the iniquity of what I have done, which is usually revealed by a message interpreted by the Holy Spirit, hey, stupid. <laughs> Guess what? <coughs> Wrong path. <coughs> Death. <coughs> Death. Non-life. Hello, anybody home? Follow the path to the left. So, so once I understand, the word meta kicks in. So I recognize what I'm doing wrong. And the Holy Spirit says, hello, 
This is not right. How many of you have ever heard the Holy Spirit say, hello, no, that's not cool. Not cool. How many of you have ignored the Holy Spirit? Everybody should be raising their hand because if you're without sin, I'm going to go out and get you a stone and you can throw it at me. And I know ain't nobody in this room without sin. Because if you're perfect, you should be up here and I'll sit where you are. <coughs> because I know I'm not perfect. And I know there are times, there have been times in my life where the Holy Spirit is screaming at me. And I'm looking for the voice. And I'm going... Well, there's nobody here. See? We need to be very, very, very still to hear the Holy Spirit's voice as it speaks to us and says, this is not in God's will. This is not in God's will. You see, even though God has given us repentance, He would like us not to have to use it every waking moment of our lives. You see, there's another thing that repentance does, is it teaches us not to go back and do the stupid things that we did when we used repentance. We're, we're supposed to learn. I mean, how many times are you going to stick your hand in a fire to figure out that it's still hot? And that it's going to burn you? And maybe one of those times you're going to stick your hand in the fire and you're going to start up. And you're not going to be able to put the fire out. And so then you become consumed. And you die. Sin unto spiritual death. So. And now we go to the word Neo. N-O-E-O. -E no E-O. Not the guy from the Matrix. Oh, now there you guys watch that movie. Not him. Now, no E-O means an understanding which brings us to the place where then and only then can we consider the mental aptitude based upon the moral culpability, which means we understand who we are before God. So let me give it to you in layman's terms. Once the Holy Spirit speaks, we enter into noeo, and we have an understanding, and the mental aptitude of the understanding creates a stir in our moral culpability and then that brings us to an understanding of who we are before God. Do you know who you are before God? Some of you are going, I don't have a clue who I am before God. You are a child, a chosen child of the risen king. A chosen child that was deemed to receive grace through sacrifice of death at the cross. As a child of the king, you have an opportunity through that grace, through salvation, to be made right, righteous, which means it brings you to right standing before God. You are sanctified. Sanctified means that you are created for something greater than the crap you are consumed with now. Period, exclamation point, all the above. You are not to be settled in the crap that you are in now because you were born for something greater than this. And the enemy, through his projection, wants you to believe that you are nothing more than what you are today. That's a lie. Because you were created for greater things than these. And that's why repentance comes into play. So it brings to mind who we were created in, his image, and that we should, what, be like him. So in that divine image, it gives us the capacity, based on the love from God, to make the decision to turn based on our moral reasoning before him. 
So in that place where we all of a sudden come to that realization, oh man, I was born in the image of God. I was born for great things. It says, I've been sanctified. I've been transformed. I, I, I've, been, I've been renewed. I'm all of this great stuff. This is not what I'm supposed to be doing. And we get a mental picture of standing before the throne room of glory and we're standing before God, and then a revelation flashes in our head, and we go, oh my God, I'm going to have to give an account for this sometime. And I'm going to see all the things that I missed because I was living in this place. Father God, you see, notice how I turned? I turned, Father God, forgive me. Bring me back to the right place that you have called me to be, to the greatness that you have called me to live. See, some of us use repentance and we keep walking down that path of sin. He's God, he's got to forgive me. It's like running in front of buses and thinking you're never going to get hit. One of those buses is going to take you out. Because the driver is going to say, that's worth 100 points, watch this. <laughs> <coughs> Frogger doesn't always cross across the road in those games. So in layman's terms, I perceive based on the love I understand, and in that understanding I make the decision. It's that easy. But if we don't understand grace, and we don't understand forgiveness, and we don't understand mercy, then we can't make a decision. Why? Because we don't believe. We don't believe. You have to believe who he is. And I'm telling you, he wants to make you complete in him. And he does it through repentance. You know, that's why Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Because at that time, they didn't know what they were doing. But when we have a mental understanding of who he is, we can make a decision not to be like who we were. So. Now, Nuse, which is N-O-O-C-E, means the mind. And every single person is given the God-given right to think, to reason. Now in the believer, it is the organ of receiving God's thoughts through faith. Notice I added, through faith. What is faith? Faith is walking in something you can't see, touch, taste, or smell. Faith is knowing that God in who he is, in his omnipresence, is standing next to you every time you move. And at the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, given the opportunity, will, trans, will translate God's word in the perfect illustration of what you need in the perfect place of time that you need it for. And in that, you will be in the perfect position which is position, which is where you'll be in positional truth, which will bring you into provisional truth, which will allow you to release the treasure because you're the treasure releasers at the right time in the right place for the right person. You just want what? In other words, the more you believe God is who he is, the more he will bring you into situations where you can release what you believe. But you can only get it through repentance. Repenting of the things we have done, or repenting of the place we are in now, which will bring us back into the place we have been called to be. Somebody just screamed. <laughs> now, but first you must understand his love. 
See, and that's another hard, hard fact to people. I, I get a number of believers, and, 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 and more than likely, ladies don't get, take offense to this, but more than likely it's the women that don't believe God loves them. And it usually comes from something stem way deep in the past through a generational curse that maybe you don't even know about. But you think love comes with certain consequences. And so a lot of times I will have women say, God doesn't love me. And it stems back from, gentlemen, listen to me, from the father's love towards the daughter. Think about that. So love has a different meaning rather than being unconditional. But I'm going to tell you this today, ladies. God loves you with an unconditional love. And he's not looking for you to perform something. He's not looking for you to give anything. He's looking for you just to believe that he loves you unconditionally and there are no strings attached. And if you let him love you, I can't even begin to tell you what will happen in your life. Because right now, not knowing that love that's unconditional, you can't forgive something. Think about that. Think about that for a minute. So the enemy brings in bitterness and anger to what? keep you from moving forward in repentance, which will make you whole. I didn't know today's message was going to be like this. In his love, we live in the faithfulness of who he is and what he has done based on <coughs> love. Now go to Romans 12. Paul, Paul, we figured out very early on that Paul literally, in Romans 7, knew about a broken soul. And he was speaking about it. But I'm not going to go to that chapter right now. You've got to be here on Friday to hear that. But Romans 12, verse 2 says this. Actually, I want to go to 1. So it's Romans 12, verse 1. It says, Brothers and sisters, in light of all I have shared with you about God's mercies, I urge you to offer your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice to God. Whole thing. Whole thing. All of it. Not just the finger, not just the toe, not just the arm, not just the heart. All of it. A sacred offering that brings him pleasure. This is your reasonable, essential worship. I'm in the voice Bible. Do not allow this world to mold you in its own image. Instead, be transformed from the inside out. Or by renewing your mind... As a result, you will be able to discern what God wills and whatever God finds good, pleasing, and complete. Now, Paul was committed to this way of thought. In Romans, Paul was writing about the three humanities that live inside of us, the worship maker and the candlestick maker. Spiritual man, religious man, and human man. Human, human nature hates God. Hates anything to do with God. Religious man, you know what? He's setting the bar so high, he's expecting everybody to jump over it. But man, if you fail to jump over it, he never does. He never jumps over it. He keeps walking under it. But when you don't jump over it, he's all over you like white on rice. And then we have spiritual man who walks the path, stumbles, falls, hears the weeping gets back up, repents, dusts himself off, and continues to walk to the best of his ability in who God has called him to be 
keeping his eye on the cross as he walks. Doesn't point anybody else's failure out because he knows he has enough of his own. And does the best that he can in walking in God's will. So Paul knew these three, and Paul was committed to that. Now where Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, he was referring to the verse in Luke 24, 45. So let's go there real quick. Luke 24, 45. You guys are probably saying, when's he going to get to the Bible? Well, as the Lord was speaking to me, he said, now this is where the verse is coming. 2445. Actually go to verse 44. Jesus was speaking. I've been telling you this all along, that everything written about me in the Hebrew scriptures must be fulfilled. Everything from the law of Moses to the prophets to the Psalms. Then he opens their minds so they can comprehend the meaning of the Hebrew scriptures. And this is what the scripture said in verse 44, that the promised anointed one should suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Verse 47, that in his name a radical change of thought. And life should be preached. And that in his name the forgiveness of sins should be preached. We're doing that today. That's repentance. That's repentance. Let me ask you something. How can you understand forgiveness if you've never forgiven? Ouch. How can you receive forgiveness if you've never learn how to forgive. So if I've never learned to forgive, then how do I learn how to repent and then live in the forgiveness of the love that comes from repentance? See how that works. So I need to resolve my anger, my bitterness, by forgiving whoever may have trespassed against me. Oh, wait, what's that? That's a commandment. in order that I may grow in the grace and the mercy and the wisdom and the knowledge of Jesus Christ in order to walk closer to his will. See how that, that, whole, that whole ball affects everything. So he wants to open the minds to understand. And as we understand, we operate, and here's another, another Greek word, thalema, T-H-E-L-E-M-A. And thalema means we act in God's preferred will rather than ours. We act in God's preferred will rather than ours. Wow. So what happens? Well, when we enter into Thelema, it means that we are what? Becoming one-minded with Christ. We understand His will, and in His will, we make the decision to act. Not in our behavior, but in his. You see that? The lean. Acting in his will, not ours. And that's what Jesus was talking about in Luke. I want to open your mind to the place where you understand who I am and start acting in my will rather than your own. When we start acting that way, we understand his way offers his 
best to offer for our lives based on what? His love for us. So what does that mean? It means his offer is the best offer, it's the greatest offer, it's the amazing offer, it's the now and now only on TV offer that brings us to a place because of love that creates what? A better place for us. Not only mentally, but physically. I know some of you are just still not happy even though you are believers, you're not happy with your lives. It's because you're still operating in your will. <coughs> you're operating in the I, not Christ movement, instead of operating in the not I, but Christ movement. And when we will operate in ourselves, then we no longer allow Christ to be the deeming factor which creates in us a provision to walk unto him, in him, and through him. You ain't going to hear this message in any other church, I will guarantee you that today. You might not hear it in the future. Now, in the process of us being able to make decisions, and here it comes, it's up to us again. Oh, Lord. We can either accept it or reject it. And it all depends on what we are allowing to lead us. If we're allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us, then we will accept it based on the truth that comes from interpretation through the Word of God, through the Holy Spirit to our heart. But if we're not functioning in that capability or that culpability, then we will believe the voice from the projection that says, nah, look, your neighbors and everybody else are acting that way and they're fine. It's up to us whether to accept or reject. Remember, God is a gentleman and he will not force his will upon anybody. You choose. You choose who you want to live in, and what you want to live in. The Word of God tells me do not be transformed into the things of this world. But I'm going to tell you, if you're listening here, and you're listening to the projections that come from the atmosphere, you will be transformed into the world. I know a lot of believers that have taken <coughs> on the facts of the world rather than the facts of spirituality, and they've allowed their moral foundations to be destroyed. And they've received and accepted what the world has to offer. The Bible says that we have to be in the world, but that we do not have to be part of the world. So the lima, which means we act in God's preferred will rather than ours, we get to make a choice on what his best offer is based on his unconditional love, which we can accept or reject. Now, the ma suffix in that, M-A, is the result that God hopes for from us based on his unconditional love, which is choosing his will. M-A, in Philema. Now, a person operating in the will of God operates in Thelo, T-H-E-L-O. And I love this because now it's taken from you and it's put on somebody else. Because in Thelo, all right, when God operates in Thelo, and it's a person operating in the will of God, that person now hopes and prays that the person repenting will choose what is best. So, so let me ask this. Let me, let me run this by you. How many people pray daily for people you're sitting next to? You don't have to raise your hands because some of you probably don't. And I, and I don't want you to, I don't want you to feel bad. 
Just because I raise my hand doesn't mean you have to raise yours. I just do that naturally. Who had who? You know, it's just it's just the way it is. But I'm going to tell you something. <coughs> you pray for people, and you know they're going through a situation. And you pray in Thelo, hoping they make the right decision and repentance to choose God's will. Watch what happens. The power of prayer is amazing. And when you offer, especially if you understand God's love and you understand forgiveness and you understand repentance and you understand all this stuff, when you pray, and you pray for the person next to you who may be in some sort of quandary, and they don't know you know, and you pray in Thilo, praying and hoping that they choose the will of God over anything else, I'm going to tell you something. It brings about an amazing change in that person. As the Lord extends His best grace, forgiveness, and mercy, now in that, there's a close connection to pistis, which means faith, and thel, which is the root of thelema, which is God's in-birth persuasion, which is, again, referenced in our Soul Trauma series, so if you were here Friday, you'd understand that. Um, it's referenced in our Soul Trauma series, because remember now, we are birthed with the soul. The soul came from the throne room of glory, and it yearns to go back to the courts of the Lord. You need to, if you if you don't understand that, Friday nights, man, that's what we're talking about. You need to be here for. I'm telling you right now, this God is my witness, and I'm not saying this just to be an idiot or anything else. More than half of you need to be here on a Friday night because I'm telling you, we've spoken. I know what's going on in your lives, and I'm telling you right now. This is the answer to every single issue in your life that is keeping you from walking in circumspect to the Lord. Amen. I'm telling you that. Amen. I don't do these things lightly, but I'm telling you right now, if you had an understanding of how God wants to knit your broken pieces of your soul back together to the core soul, I'm telling you, I'm t it's no BS, I'm telling you, you can be healed. You can be healed of emotional stuff, mental stuff, physical stuff. I'm telling you, it's amazing things. How, how, Pastor Mark, how can I do that? Well, it's easy. Get in your car. Drive here Friday night. Come on and sit down. Because I, I know probably there's four questions. Because everybody that's here on a Friday night is. But this whole thing on repentance goes with everything about the soul series. with understanding your love. <coughs> understanding that you must forgive. And understanding that God's love is an amazing provision that does amazing things in your life. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, you don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. You don't have to be anxiety and anxious. Um, you don't have to be this. You don't have to be that. This, this last Friday, we spoke on DID. Which is... Di Disassociated some disorder. Uh, right. Dissociative identity disorder. We spoke on that. So please turn to 2 Corinthians 8. We're going to wrap this up in a second here. 2 Corinthians 8. Verse 5. They came to us on their own, begging to take part in this work of grace to support the poor saints in Judea. We were so overwhelmed, none of us expected their reaction. That they truly, here's the word, turned their lives over to the Lord and then gave themselves to support us in our work as we answer the call of God. And now go to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10.36 A 
Hear the little kids over there singing their little hearts out. It's cool. For a minute, I thought it was all the heaven singing, and I was getting that closer to Jesus. <laughs> little angelic voices next door. So 1036. Actually, go to verse 35. You knew I was going to do that. Anyway. <laughs> Verse 35 says, remember this, and do not abandon your confidence, which will lead to rich rewards. Simply endure. For when you have done as God requires of you, you will receive the promise. As the prophet Habakkuk said, in a little while, only a little longer, the one who is coming will come without delay. For my righteous one must live by faith. For if he gives up his commitment, my soul will have no pleasure in him. So both of these bring in the light that we know what is right. And it was instilled within the soul at birth. So the soul has a moral compass, but until we receive the life of Christ, it doesn't know which way to turn. So in love, Christ gives us a way to turn. In the correct direction. Can you imagine somebody locking you in a room and never giving you a way out? That's the sin nature. You're locked in a room and you're never giving a way out. But here's the love of God. He gives you a provision to exit, to turn. So even when we are believers and we make a stupid decision and we walk in the ways of the world and we walk in sin, God says, look, there's the door. But you have to turn and walk out and shut the door and never go back. See? So we, we, have, we are going to go through certain things. And those certain things are for us. But in love, Christ always gives us a way to turn in the correct direction that brings us back into the right place with him. And here's the last part of this. His grace forgets what we have. We wander off the path. We repent. We come back right with God. And you know what happens? He erases that. Now in heaven, we're going to see what we would have missed in that. But he's not going to bring up what we did in that. He's going to say, had you followed me, this is what would have happened. This is the blessings that would have been released and the things that would have happened. But he's not going to say, and this is what you did. He's going to say, we're not going to talk about what you did, but this is what happened because you did. See, and, and you're going to get to see how many people it would have impacted. Had you. Had you. That's why it's so important to repent and understand that God gives you a way out. Why? Because of his love. Please bow your heads and close your eyes. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're still trying to figure this out. I, I want to stop right there for a minute. But we're still praying. Maybe there's people in here today that do not understand how much they are loved. God is gentle. He's a gentle God, but he's a jealous God. And in his gentleness, he wants to wrap his arms of love around you. And he wants to hide you. And he wants to heal you. And he wants to Maybe some of you have been holding on to things that for some reason you just can't seem to let go. Today God is telling you it's finished. It's time to allow me to take what is not yours and to restore you to the place 
where you understand that you are loved. It's time for you to forget what has happened because you can't fix it. But it's time for me to erase it from you and bring you to a place where you can be made strong. Today, release that. It's a form of repentance, but it's the first step in understanding how to walk in God's will. It's the first part of repentance. First admitting you're a sinner and that you've been outside of God's will. And second, understanding that you need to be in God's will. And so you're asking him to forgive you and forget the things that you've done, which he does. When you do that, there's 65 special blessings that happen, as we've been talking about on Wednesday. Special treasures that are given to you. And those 65 things are amazing. And they come when you just say, Lord, come into my heart, save me, forgive me, Father, from my sin. Forgive me. Transform me, renew me, sanctify me. Forgive me. Now, if you've never said that prayer before, if you've never asked Jesus Christ to be a part of your life, that, and that was your prayer, you just asked Christ to be a part of your life, and you only have to say it once. You don't have to say it over and over again. Then, then I just want you to lift your hand up real quick and then just put it back down so I can pray for you. Has anybody said, has anybody said ever thank you? Anybody else? Anybody else? Father God, we just thank you, Lord. Father, I am asking you today to deliver those, Father, that hold anger and hold bitterness and hold resentment, Father. Because, Lord, that's a hindrance. And that's blocking them from receiving every single thing you have. Every single thing you have. But, Father, they have to make that decision make that decision to release those things. So Father, I'm asking you Lord to just bring that to them. Allow them to release the things that are holding them back. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, protect us as we go, Father. Keep us safe, Lord. And with us this week, Father, help us turn to you. Thank you, love you. We praise you, Father. In your precious name we pray, Lord. Amen.